So today's webinar is the first in a new series co-hosted by Cities of Migration and Welcoming America about welcoming economies and, uh, and a new agenda for shared urban prosperity. Today we present Welcoming Economies, Immigrants Are Key to Inclusive Economic Growth. Smart cities understand that immigrants are key to a vibrant urban economy and regional economic growth. The challenge is how to successfully attract and retain immigrant skill and talent in an increasingly competitive race to the top. So how can cities tap the economic opportunities that immigrants bring? How do cities foster innovation, investment, and wealth creation to benefit both immigrants and the community at large? What is a welcoming community? To help us answer these questions, and uh, we're delighted uh, to welcome our special guest today, Steve Tobachman, Executive Director of Global Detroit, who joins us uh, to share his vision and big ideas for how we can revitalize regional economies by making a strong business case for immigration. Steve has spent the past six years spearheading Global Detroit, a regional economic revitalization strategy for the Detroit area focused on immigration and global connections. The seminal Global Detroit study published in May 2010 has helped leverage more than $7 million in philanthropic and government funding into a wide range of life-saving initiatives for the city and the wider Detroit region, including the Michigan Global Talent Retention Initiative, Welcome Michigan, Prosper U.S. Detroit, Welcome Matt Detroit, and a Detroit office for the New York-based Upwardly Global. Global Detroit has also served as the foundation for Michigan Governor Rick Snyder's Michigan Office for New Americans and his efforts to scale these efforts on a statewide basis. And of course, Steve is also the driving force behind the We Global Network, a, a booming multi-city, multi-state network of local immigrant economic development initiatives that is sweeping across the American Northeast and I think is probably ready to scale. So on that note, I'll, I will turn it over to Steve. Welcome uh, to Cities of Migration and the Learning Exchange. The podium is yours. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I apologize to the attendees that I've uh, was without a voice a couple of days ago. It's it's coming back, and so if there's some uh, some hiccups during the presentation, I apologize. I, I really want to thank Cities of Migration and, of course, our good friends and partners at Welcoming America for this Welcoming Economies uh, webinar series and for the work that you all have been doing over the years. Um, we have borrowed some of your best ideas uh, to move Detroit and our region forward. And so I am, I am very grateful and, and honored to be uh, a presenter as the, uh, for the kickoff webinar for this Welcome to Economy series. So um, just to let you know that I wanted to talk, uh, I'll be talking about immigrants in the Rust, Rust Belt. And we, just, we, we have defined that for WE Global Network, uh, roughly from New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan um, as our 10-state region. Um, you can see in this map um, uh, the WE Global Network, which launched this past April as a new initiative with Welcoming America. Prior, we had been uh, loosely affiliated to something called the Global Great Lakes Network, uh, but we've rebranded ourselves, and this is the 10-state region of, for our core. We do accept members from cities who um, uh, look like our cities. These stars are programs that we have connected with and been working with, and uh, we expect these stars to grow. Um, we've done two uh, annual convenings, the first in Detroit 2013, the second in Pittsburgh in 2014. Um, so the members of uh, the WE Global Network, and it's probably hard to read this slide, um, they range from the Welcoming Center for New Pennsylvanians, St. Louis Mosaic, Global Cleveland, uh, the city of Chicago's uh, Office of New Americans, uh, Welcome Dayton, Vibrant Pittsburgh, Welcome Toledo Lucas County, Global Pittsburgh, Global Detroit, and uh, uh, representation in Buffalo, Cincinnati, and more, uh, Columbus as well. The interesting thing is that most of these initiatives that are on this page or on the prior slide um, are less than five or six years old. Um, in particular, 
the Michigan office for New America in St. Louis Mosaic, Global Cleveland, the city of Chicago's office, Welcome Dayton, Lucas County office, Welcome Springfield, Vibrant Pittsburgh, Global Detroit, Agenda 360, Global Lansing, One Macomb, are all uh, really less than five years old. And what has happened across the Rust Belt is that there's been a growing realization that immigrants are a source of economic growth. And uh, you've probably seen this photo before. It is uh, often used to talk about a paradigm shift. Uh, this photo both could be a younger woman who is looking off uh, with a feather in her cap and looking off to the left, uh, 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 and you're seeing the, her hair and her ear and sort of the back of, of her hat. Or it could be an older woman uh, who is kind of crouched down, and, and, this is, and the black becomes her hair, and uh, uh, the left side of the picture becomes her nose. And hopefully you could see both perspectives. Um, so these are the same lines on the same page, but obviously two different images. And the work that we've been doing uh, locally and through uh, the We Global Network is a little bit like that. So for really over a century now, Americans have been uh, welcoming and integrating immigrants into their communities with varying degrees of success. And um, there has a long, more recent history in immigrant rights, civil rights, and immigrant social services to help struggling refugee and immigrant populations uh, with their basic needs and their economic success. Um, these economic development initiatives uh, kind of stand on a little bit of new ground uh, where they see immigrants as assets and contributions. And they're asking the question about how to assist immigrants uh, from the perspective of what we call the receiving community or the overall community. We are, many of us are equally concerned about uh, the non-immigrants and how they create opportunities and benefits um, by interacting with immigrant and refugee populations, whereas traditionally uh, immigrant rights and integration services have focused on a social justice imperative and focusing on helping the least of these. Um, this has created, uh, our programs have created new, uh, standing in the paradigm that we are, we see new opportunities for action and new programs that maybe we would not have seen before and are um, uh, embracing immigration in new and exciting ways. We've also brought exciting new partners to the table. So many of us work closely with the Chamber of Commerce, like Global Detroit. We were originally housed at our regional Chamber of Commerce, which is not a group that had traditionally been part of the immigration debate. Um, you can see the values for our network. Again, that immigrant communities are assets that they create economic opportunity for everyone, not just uh, not just creating economic opportunity for immigrants and refugees, and that by welcoming them, we create a more economically competitive and socially attractive region, more vibrant region. Um, and finally, that uh, by engaging in proactive uh, programming, that we can create economic development initiatives that will not only attract and retain immigrants, but really help our entire uh, community. So these are the um, these are the goals of the We Global Network, and um, we will be doing our third convening, by the way, in uh, Dayton this July uh, 9th. And you can go to weglobalnetwork.org or just Google Welcoming Economies Global Network, and you will find information about our convening on July 9th in Dayton. Um, so what do what do we know about immigrants, and why have so many local economies across that Rust Belt region embraced immigration, and particularly in this last decade. Uh, research by the Partnership for a New American Economy suggests that full 41% of the Fortune 500 companies were started by American immigrants or the children of American immigrants. And that these companies are, are the name brands that you see across the world. Collectively, they produce $4.2 trillion in annual revenue, which is greater than the gross domestic product of every nation in the world, except for the US, China, and Japan. Um, in America, we've seen uh, uh, somewhat declining rates of business startups in the wake of the global recession. And immigrants have maintained steady self-employment rates, and thus, uh, as many as 28% of all the small businesses um, in a given year were started by immigrants. That's more than twice their average in the population. America is 13% foreign-born as a country. Um, it's not just starting businesses, but uh, and it's not 
all businesses, but main street businesses. And in America, we define that as kind of your retail opportunities, your uh, grocery stores, your gas stations, your uh, convenience stores, your restaurants, your laundromats, dry cleaners. And we see that 28% of all the main street businesses in the country are immigrant owned. In fact, this slide tells you about what has happened in the last uh, little over a decade in America. So the blue is, represents growth or loss of immigrant-owned Main Street businesses. And these are most of the top 50 largest metropolitan areas. And what you see is in virtually every area, uh, immigrants have created more businesses uh, over the last 13 years, but also virtually in every area. US-born Main Street businesses have seen a loss. In most cases, in 31 of the 50 top metros, the growth in immigrant-owned businesses has outpaced the loss of US-born owned businesses. It's created more businesses. But in many cities like Detroit and Cleveland, we've unfortunately lost more businesses um, than immigrants have created, and immigrants have been helping offset the impacts. Additional reasons why we're embracing immigration is because they tend to be high exporting businesses, which are important to the economy. They tend to start high tech firms. Um, in fact, a quarter of all the high tech firms created between 1995 and 2005, according to Duke University and the University of California, Berkeley, were created by at least an immigrant uh, founder. And the highest ratio of immigrant started high tech firms is in Silicon Valley, uh, which is obviously the world's tech leader. And there is 52 percent. Uh, surprisingly, Michigan, which is a low immigration state, finds itself very highly ranked with 32.8% of the high tech firms during this period. It means that immigrants are six times as likely to start a high tech firm than their overall presence in the population. They also account for a lot of the venture capital firms that succeed. And they make up a significant portion of the STEM trained workers, so science, technology, engineering, and math. In fact, across the country, between 40 and 60% of all the graduate degrees in STEM are awarded to international students. So not only in starting high-tech firms, but they're providing the workforce that we need to grow in the new economy. Um, more importantly, in America, and also Canadian and many Western uh, uh, economies, uh, we are rapidly aging. We have a very low birth rate, and immigrants are uh, and it's, we don't have a, a sustainable retirement system. And immigrants come in, they're much likely to be more working age. They're much likely to have higher birth rates. They're much likely to be more likely to be married. And they, those marriages last. Finally, we've talked a lot about the high tech economy, about the workforce we need. But frankly, just revitalizing distressed urban areas, or this notion in Europe of shrinking cities, or we like to call them legacy cities here in the Rust Belt. Um, uh, but uh, what we see is that um, in cities that have revitalized in, in the industrial area, whether they be Toronto, Vancouver, uh, Boston, or New York, uh, immigration has played an incredible role in revitalizing neighborhoods. So the question becomes, with those realizations, what have really mainstream actors, chambers of commerce, elected officials, and economic development practitioners what are the opportunities that they can foster these benefits for their communities? So the type of work that we do ranges from international student retention and looking at those 40 to 60 percent of the graduate degrees in STEM and how to keep those students after they graduate to workforce development for those without very much formal uh, education um, and everything in between. I am not going to, uh, because of time, I'm not going to go through this entire list. But I do want to talk a little bit about entrepreneurship initiatives. Um, come, as, as Rachel said, Welcoming America in the coming weeks will be issuing an overview guide to immigrant economic development. And frankly, um, the, the exact strategies that are on this slide here are covered by chapter in that guide. And so we studied what was going on to encourage immigrant entrepreneurship. Most of these programs are not focused on the high-tech uh, firms. They're focused on the Main Street style firms um, and the service industry firms. And really, the fact that many immigrants are self-employed and many refugees are self-employed in service industry jobs, from cleaning homes to watching people's children to doing construction work, 
as well as grocery stores and restaurants and dry cleaners um, and other businesses. So um, this slide features two programs, uh, the Neighborhood Development Center in Minneapolis-St. Paul, which is entering its uh, close to its 25th anniversary and has created more, uh, more than 500 existing businesses. 60% um, of those businesses are in formerly vacant spaces and they pay uh, over $17 an hour to their employees and they have offered this training in six different languages and in many ethnic communities. And on the left is Prosperous Detroit, the program that we helped launch here in Detroit. Both of these programs also are available to African Americans and non-immigrants within the urban environment. Um, but what we see as critical is language and cultural accessibility. Um, those, that is a key piece. Too often in the United States, we have wonderful entrepreneurship programs, um, but they are offered through institutions uh, and in ways that do not meet the needs and do not connect well with immigrants and refugee populations. Um, the research that we did also focuses on both of these programs are comprehensive. They include a micro-lending portion to the program as well as ongoing supports to graduates from a basic 12-session business planning course. There are other programs that really focus on just the language and cultural competency and then handhold and refer uh, potential immigrant entrepreneurs and refugee entrepreneurs to the existing infrastructure and make sure that they can access those programs. Other programs focus on specific types of businesses, like the U.S. federal government and its Office of Refugee Resettlement provides uh, some dollars to support local programs that, chain, that train refugee women in child health care. Uh, I'm sorry, child care issues. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to talk a little bit about international student retention. And these are the facts that I presented before. But interestingly enough, follow-up research on those high-tech entrepreneurs finds that the average immigrant high-tech entrepreneur starts their business 13 years after coming to the United States. And the most common reason why they've come to the United States is to get an education. So here in Michigan, we launched the Michigan Global Talent Retention Initiative. And it is a partnership now between 32 Michigan colleges and universities that have roughly 27,000 international students studying at them. By the way, this is an $800 million export product for the state of Michigan as those international students consume local uh, goods and services from the university as well as pay rent and buy groceries locally. Um, we also work with over 60 employers and we make a connection uh, both by convincing the students that they should want to stay in Michigan and connecting them with employers that are looking for the talent they can't find. Similarly, the Ohio Board of Regents, which is their state university system, recently issued a report in, uh, in partnership with the Partnership for a New American Economy called Making the Grade, talking about how if Ohio were to increase its retention of international students, uh, it could vastly grow its economy. And they are in the process now of implementing recommendations related to this report. What we know is that every foreign STEM worker with an advanced US degree creates over 2.62 American jobs, additional jobs. And that's why some of us have focused on that type of program. Um, then there are uh, programs that have uh, communities that have focused on attraction and retention of immigrants of all walks of life. So Welcome Dayton, there's a reason why we're having our conference in Dayton, because Welcome Dayton has put together one of the most ambitious uh, plans to attract and retain immigrants and refugees within its community. The Welcome Dayton plan, which I believe was adopted in 2013, is supported by the mayor, the city council, the regional chamber of commerce, and everyone in the region. It, uh, the, with very limited resources, they have created five working committees around economic development, around government services, education, and other topics. And they work to make sure that immigrants are integrated into the community in a way that uh, both encourages them to stay, and they've seen significant growth in their immigrant, one of the fastest growing uh, percentage-wise immigrant communities in the United States, um, but also that benefits accrue to the communities in which they settle in. Similarly, uh, what is now called Welcome Toledo Lucas County, and this is an old slide, um, is really being launched by the County Board of Commissioners. But they have had a number of core partners, including uh, the city, 
including the university, the local initiative support corporation, which is a national intermediary for neighborhood and community development, their local legal services group, and uh, uh, ethnic social service agencies like Adelante and others. Um, and they're all working together on a multi-sector initiative to attract and retain in, in, uh, immigrants. Finally, in 2013, I believe, St. Louis Mosaic launched. St. Louis Mosaic is very focused on the economic opportunity and integration, and it is uh, very well integrated into the county and regional um, economic development programs. It focuses on a, uh, an initiative to connect, um, actually an initiative that cities of migration has highlighted before out of Halifax, a professional connector network, so that volunteers uh, sign up and they go to coffee with new immigrant professionals and introduce them to three people out of their contact list so that they can build their professional network. St. Louis Mosaic works with partners like the International Institute on everything from uh, entrepreneurship programs to uh, welcoming programs to connecting with talent and even working with international students. So those are some of the things that we're doing uh, 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 organically. These are happening. None of us are working for, from a playbook, and so we recognize the opportunities that are created uh, in our regions of the world um, by embracing immigration. And we're standing on a new paradigm that is not just asking the question from a social justice imperative of what do immigrants need and how do we uh, help uh, folks who have faced very dire circumstances but asking how can these assets and opportunities that have created enormous benefits in our communities, how can we grow and um, prosper by being more integrated and inclusive of immigrants and refugees, and how can the non-immigrant or receiving community or the incumbent community um, benefit by being a more welcoming community? And that's why we have created the Welcoming Economy to Global Network. This last slide is, um, written by Tom Friedman, but I do think in a more global world, this notion that America has benefited by uh, very open borders um, and, and integrating newcomers and new ideas into its economy um, is one that every country can take advantage of. And that concludes my opening remarks, and I look forward to questions. Well, that's great. I want to thank you very much, Steve. I, and I'm going to now um, introduce our today's uh, uh, special guest interviewer. Sarah Wayland um, is joining us from Hamilton, Canada, from Global Hamilton, where Sarah leads the Global Hamilton Initiative for the City. Um, which is about 60 kilometers south of Toronto. Global Hamilton uh, seeks to attract and support entrepreneurial and skilled immigrants to Hamilton, including international students. And Sarah herself has a well-established reputation as a researcher um, specializing in immigration and settlement across a wide range of issues. Her most recent uh, publication, for example, looks at government as employer of skilled immigrants. So it's into Sarah's very able hands. I now um, pass the, the podium. So uh, Sarah's going to help us unpack some of the wonderful ideas that Steve has shared with us today. So welcome, Sarah. Thanks very much. It's a really interesting uh, forum and a pleasure to be here. Glad that so many people are interested in this topic that is completely fascinating to me. Um, so Steve, I have a few questions for you. Um, sure. You and I have had a chance to um, connect before this webinar uh, just because of our professional lives intersect and I want to um, reiterate that the work that you've done with Global Detroit was really um, influential in determining our course of action in the city of Hamilton uh, when I first started that work about two and a half years ago. So it's a pleasure to be able to interview you today. Um, I wanted to start by asking you about the relationship, how you cultivate relationships with employers. Um, your model that you've described today uh, depends heavily on engaging local employers, both uh, private sector businesses but also big institutional employers like city governments, for example. I'm wondering if you could give us an example of an employer or a sector or even a city that has been particularly receptive to um, the initiatives of attracting immigrants, um, and what are the keys to effective employer engagement? That's a great question because 
we really are um, less about trying to set up unique uh, niche programs that will um, help immigrants and refugees, but really want the, to change the systems um, in which immigrants and refugees and, and, and communities that to make them more inclusive. So, you know, it would be really wonderful and if in five or ten years we didn't need a global Detroit because every employer was looking at uh, diverse talent and every sector uh, and city was looking at how to be inclusive. In the interim, um, we are, we really do often have to um, work with employers to open their eyes to that talent. Um, so uh, at the end, I'll, I'll remind me. I will. I will. I can talk about one of those uh, institutions or one of those companies. But we um, really um, value and strategize about the private sector employers because uh, so much employment happens in the private sector. And we have really decided to prioritize our outreach efforts. We, I personally have probably done 35 employer visits, and I'm hoping to do another one, by the way, at lunch today, if, if my lunch plans uh, uh, are still around. They may be falling through. Um, but um, and we, we, the way we prioritize are, are first of all, immigrant-owned businesses are obviously uh, employers who are very susceptible and open to our requests. But secondly, we have uh, targeted sectors in the economy that really need the kind of immigrant talent um, that we think is an opportunity. And for us, that means a sector that use uh, STEM talent, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, so we are in the tech community, in the information technology or IT community. Healthcare is a target of ours. Automotive design, obviously, in Southeast Michigan, we are the automotive capital of the world in advanced manufacturing. And we have really tried to reach out to um, uh, whether they be private sector, you know, sort of chambers of commerce or others in those sectors to connect with uh, businesses in those areas. Finally, foreign-owned business is a major factor here. I mean, Southeast Michigan, because of the automotive heritage, we, we literally have over a thousand international companies in the metro region. One of the things I have to say is for us is that your large multinational corporations frankly know a lot of this stuff and sort of have their systems in place. And so while they've been partners supporting us, when we talk about the International Student Retention Program or working with Upwardly Global to connect skilled immigrants, they already have many systems in place to work through international students and H-1B applications or think about retraining um, uh, other, other programs. And so I've been surprised over the last five years at how much um, we've really had to focus on the small and medium-sized employers. Um, what I would say is the key to being uh, an effective engagement strategy is that you really do need to do that full time. We have not been able to do that for our first five years. We are very excited that in August we will be getting a full time corporate engagement uh, fellow through a program called the Detroit Revitalization Fellowship. And um, in addition to having that person not only do uh, targeted outreach to employers and private sector entities. We have long had um, really strong support by chambers of commerce, economic development agencies, our tech startup type um, institutions like uh, Ann Arbor Spark, and Automation Alley, and Tech Town, and sometimes ethnic chambers and uh, uh, entrepreneurship um, chambers like Kai. So to Finally, end this answer. A great example for us is a company called Kaiba, K Y Y B A. Kaiba is uh, spearheaded by Tel Ganesan, and Tel happens to be a Global Detroit board member. But Tel um, emigrated to the United States um, about 30 years ago. He came to Wayne State University to get a graduate engineering degree. He got a job out of engineering school with Chrysler and spent uh, close to 15 years working as an engineer in Chrysler before leaving to launch his first uh, entrepreneurial endeavor, one of these high-tech firms. And Kaiba is an IT solutions firm. They do staffing, and they also help uh, companies create IT solutions to their problems. Tel has grown that business to 450 global employees, 250 of which are in Southeast Michigan and 200 of which are in India. 
uh, Tao understands the international student experience and has been an eager employer to work with our international student talent and uh, to connect with those students and, and try to hire the best and the brightest from that pool. Um, so that's an example. Tao is um, somebody that we met through uh, CHI, which is an international um, Indian entrepreneurship club or network. And, uh, and then he just, from the moment we met, he understood the opportunity we were talking about. And he has been a supporter as well as um, a consumer of the programs that we have helped launch. Wow, that's a long and very uh, complex and wonderful answer. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. And um, just in, it prompts a lot of follow-up thoughts and questions, but I want to cover some different areas. So I'd like to move on and um, ask you a question about network. Um, you mentioned, and we hear a lot, about the race for talent and cities being in competition with each other for resources and investment. Yet one of the really, what I find really interesting about We Global Network is that you're bringing cities together under a single network. So what is it about the welcoming economies approach that appeals to local governments and that kind of flies in the face of, like, how does this uh, tension between cities being in competition with each other and the desire or the impetus to work together? How does that turn so out? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned in the presentation, we are all coming to this realization of how um, how much opportunity there is by being welcoming to immigrants and refugees in our communities, and it's particularly true in the Rust Belt where we see a much more college-educated uh, immigrant population, where we are economies that are transitioning from manufacturing and industrial uh, base to a more new economy, and that we have distressed cities that have hemorrhaged population loss, Detroit being really the poster child of that, and how much working class immigrants are important to, to those cities. So the reality is that many who are immigrating to the United States from uh, abroad or even those facing secondary migration uh, strategies. So what I mean is that, for example, we have a number of Bangladeshi immigrants in the Detroit area who uh, were, lived at one point in Queens, New York, in New York City. And they've come here for the value proposition that they can buy a home and start a business for literally one-fifth to one-tenth of the cost of what it would be in Queens. But the reality is that those immigrants are largely not looking at, you know, what is Detroit doing versus what is Cleveland doing to welcome me. They are much more likely, and immigration is much more likely to happen through personal networks. So they had a cousin who came to Detroit and that cousin, or they had someone from their village who came to Detroit and that person was successful and found the community to be receptive, welcoming, and a, and, a, and a nice place to live. And then they sent word out. And so I don't think people are really choosing their, particularly their global migration strategies by comparing different cities in the same region, um, Toledo versus Detroit or Cleveland, we're all uh, within an hour and a half of each other each way. Uh, and uh, I, I, so it makes sense for us to collaborate because, as I said, we are in a new paradigm with this work. Most of us have been doing this for less than five years old. There are really only, you know, when you look at something like international student retention, I believe the Michigan Global Talent Retention Initiative is the only one like it in the country. Ohio is about to launch something. St. Louis Mosaic does some work with its universities, but really doesn't even have a single full-time staff person working on that initiative. Um, so we get more out of collaboration and learning and trying to tackle this new paradigm together than we do in competition. And I think that's why um, uh, the, the network has been so successful at drawing uh, virtually every initiative from this 10 state region that has launched into our network. And our mission is to support these local initiatives, not to create a new big infrastructure you know, network that is doing programs itself. So I think that's a really good point. When I first started this work, I you know, had a lot of ideas, but I wasn't sure what was really viable and what, um, you know, I, I didn't know what would work. And so reading examples and learning about best practices from other communities was um, really helpful, not only in um, refining my own ideas, but in getting me excited that other communities were thinking along the same lines. and you know, trying something similar, that it wasn't just me, but it was, you know, a part. I was part of a broader movement, and our, our work at Global Hamilton was part of something 
bigger and a bigger trend. So, yeah, thanks for that answer. Um, I do wonder, though, um, it, uh, when you make the business case in your presentation and with all this talk of economic development with immigration, is there risk of losing sight of the human element and the personal challenges that are faced by immigrants? Like, how do we balance the economic argument with that of the focus on families building new lives under challenging conditions? I think there is a real risk, and I think there's a risk that's inherent to any kind of regional economic development strategy, regardless of whether we were talking about immigrants or African Americans or workers facing you know, transitions from skill sets that were viable in a manufacturing economy and are no longer viable in a new economy. Ways that we tackle that, though, are, uh, first of all, we think storytelling is very important. Um, we need to highlight successes as well as highlight challenges and make sure that um, we're not only using data to guide our, our decisions, and I think data is very important um, in, in where you start with, but that we're also uh, not forgetting that human element by talking about individual stories. Uh, a second piece is that I do think it's really important that programs connect with the individuals. So um, that can happen any number of ways, but I'm always uh, you know, encouraging those around our work to go to uh, a naturalization ceremony, which is a process in the United States where uh, one who is an immigrant um, becomes a citizen. And uh, for those of us, you know, um, uh, it can be a very moving uh, event for folks given uh, the, the history of the United States and, and how for many people, including my family, this was a place of refuge and a place of opportunity that they couldn't get um, in the countries that they existed in, in Eastern Europe as Jews in the you know, 19th and 20th century. But many of us connect with that American story. And so just being reminded of the, of the real gift and the opportunity that we have in, in, many of our, in many of the communities that we lived in in Western Europe and in, in Canada and, and in the United States, I think is really important to remind us of what we're doing. And, it, and we need to keep that human element in front of us. And it's a, it is a real challenge. And um, particularly, I find the challenge that we work very closely with a variety of folks in the immigrant rights movement, as well as uh, those who do integration services and who live that hu the human element every day and see firsthand every day the very significant challenges that immigrants and refugees to the United States can face. But at the same time, we are really trying to bring in chambers of commerce and large corporations and economic development practitioners. And those two communities sometimes use very different language in talking about their work. And um, we, you know, Welcoming America has been a great partner in helping us develop uh, language that can both appeal to the corporate boardroom as well as be inclusive and um, appropriate with immigrant and refugee communities. OK. I think I have time for one more um, quick question. Um, immigration is a national phenomenon, but we're rooted in cities. And it's interesting that Global Detroit and many of the initiatives you're talking about, they're all coming out of specific cities. My own work is within a city government, for example. So cities are on the front line when it comes to receiving immigrants, but cities don't really have much say or any say in immigration policy. So I'm wondering if you could tell us about how the WE Global Network is trying to influence immigration policy um, at the local level even. What is your approach and what opportunities are there for advancing the role of cities in the immigration debate? Sure. So, and, and we're broad. So some of our members are in city government. Some of them, like Global Detroit, are in non, the NGO sector, nonprofit sector, and partner with city government. Uh, and some of them are even in state government. So we work closely with the Michigan Office for New Americans and the New York office as well, the state of New York office. Um, so um, we, most of us are not focused um, on the federal policy debate, but we do work with partners, um, both within our region and nationally, that are focused on federal policy. And I think there's widespread agreement that, in the United States at least, 
federal policy needs to be changed and, and uh, that we have a broken immigration system. So We Global works with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs uh, and their Midwest Immigration Task Force, the Partnership for a New American Economy, Welcome.us and Forward.us, as well as groups from the U.S. Chamber, the Great Lakes Metro Chambers, the American Immigration Council, National Immigration Forum, and others. But more specific to your question, we have um, started a, a really collaborative process, uh, a publication called Ideas That Innovate, that you can again find on our website at weglobalnetwork.org. And this highlights state and local policies that support immigrant economic development. We've highlighted things from the seal of biliteracy that helps um, uh, reward students who graduate from uh, U.S. school systems and that are able to demonstrate uh, proficiency in more than one language and affixes a golden seal to their diploma to reward that uh, those abilities. Um, to um, Michigan's program to help uh, outline licensing and credentialing paths for foreign trained workers and uh, those who have received um, their professional training at uh, foreign universities. Uh, we've also highlighted New York State's use of opportunity centers and funding of local opportunity centers to integrate immigrants and refugees. And as I mentioned, you know, the Ohio Board of Regents recent report on international student retention. Um, the nice thing about the ideas that innovate um, publication is they're very short. And they're merely uh, there to collect and help um, raise up and disseminate these best practices. And we'd love to get contributions from anyone on this um, call or otherwise who see no great state and local policies that others should learn about. Um, we also work with partners like the Pew Center and their project on immigration in the states to highlight these local policies. But as I said, this is a paradigm shift. This is new work. And as a result, um, we largely um, lack many of the state and local policies that we need to support this work. And I know that many of us in the We Global Network sometimes have found uh, supporters in state and local government who turn to us and say, um, what can I do to support you? And we're so uh, used to dealing, particularly in the United States, with often state and local initiatives that discriminate against and discourage immigration, particularly focused on those who may be undocumented or in the process of getting legal status, um, that are usually our first answer is, please don't do any harm. Don't make it any more difficult. Don't discriminate uh, against uh, international community in our, in our region. And we really haven't had the luxury of focusing on what are those state and local policies that should be developed to foster more integration and inclusivity. Great. I think that I am out of time, although I think I could talk to you for a couple more hours and would appreciate that someday, but uh, I think I have to turn it back over to the moderators. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to thank both you, uh, Steve and Sarah, for that fascinating conversation. Really, the, the, we are talking about ideas that innovate. This is very exciting. But we do have some great questions that have come in from our audience, so I'm going to quickly move um, to the first of those questions. I have a question from Tamara Zare in Alberta, here in Canada, in our Prairie Provinces. She is interested in finding out how the Chambers of Commerce were engaged. In Alberta, she notes they're rarely involved um, with welcoming community uh, diversity work, so she'd love to hear more about how you got them involved in Detroit. So so, I, so. Great. Yeah, so let me just answer from the Detroit perspective. So first of all, um, my background is in neighborhood and community development in the nonprofit sector. And um, I then served in the state legislature for six years and was fortunate enough at the end of that um, to be in the majority leader, which is the second ranking position in the Michigan House of Representatives. We have very severe term limits, so at the age of 38, I was uh, I had filled my lifetime term uh, and ability to serve in the state legislature. But that enabled me to work with the Chamber of Commerce on a variety of issues and, and get to know them. And as we launched the Global Detroit study, it was really the regional uh, foundations who started the conversation. But the uh, Chamber was very interested, and this is at the height of Michigan's lost decade, we like to call it. And I don't want to get into how horrible, but no state has seen what Michigan saw, um, where we literally lost one out of every five jobs uh, in the state. 
between uh, 2000 and 2010, and we saw ourselves go from the 17th wealthiest state in per capita income to the 41st wealthiest state in, out of the 50 states uh, in per capita income in 10 short years. And so things were pretty desperate. And um, as you know, two of the, uh, the big three, you know, um, General Motor and Chrysler, uh, were went bankrupt, and everybody was, uh, their corporate bonds were in junk status. And, Subsequent to that, the city of Detroit went bankrupt. Um, and so the need to get more talent was something that was very much on the chamber's uh, agenda. And, uh, and so they actually put uh, some of the original money into this. And we went through a 15-month study process with quarterly meetings. And we did a lot of things to make the chamber types and corporate types comfortable. So we went through great pains to make sure that folks believe this to be an economic development initiative as opposed in, in this new paradigm as opposed to uh, an immigrant rights or social services initiative. Our original steering committee um, really did not include traditional um, immigrant rights and social service agencies that most people think about when they talk about immigration. We did include ethnic chambers of commerce. We also made great pains not just to have chambers of commerce, but we included African American organizations, organized labor, um, and others. And so we went through a process and made sure that the mission of the Global Detroit Study was to ask the question of how do we, how can immigrants and refugees be a part of Detroit? And that was the question we asked as opposed to how do we alleviate the challenges um, facing immigrants and refugees. And so that was a different question. And over time, uh, I'll just report at the very last meeting, um, I remember somebody from the chamber who is uh, definitely not somebody who has worked on immigration in the past um, and is a fairly conservative person, stand up in the room and said, underlying this all, we really need to be welcoming. Let's not forget that. Let's make sure that that is in our programming, and that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't spent 15 months in a in an environment in which the chamber felt very comfortable and felt that the work we were doing was uh, helping them pursue their mission. That that's great. Now I have a couple of questions now on 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 uh, immigrant entrepreneurship, and then a couple more on international students. We'll see how far we get. But from Tommy Wang, I have the question: Have you seen? Uh, he wants to know about innovative funding models to help immigrant entrepreneurs access capital? So there are a range of um, in innovative models, lending circles um, that capitalize on um, the traditions and customs that people bring from their home native countries um, and recreate those opportunities to help businesses. Um, I'm less familiar with those um, programs. Uh, there are other programs like the programs that I highlighted in the presentation at Neighborhood Development Center and Prosperous Detroit that are what we call character-based lending. What we see is that a lot of immigrants um, and refugees don't have, um, in the United States, you know, we have a, something called a credit report that tracks your debts and credits uh, in your personal financial information. And even very affluent um, international uh, workers who may come and earn considerable money but maybe haven't used the U.S. banking systems or credit cards will get very poor credit scores in the United States. Um, and so in our micro uh, entrepreneurship program, we make, and I sit on the loan committee for Prosperous Detroit, we make lots of loans um, to people who have a credit score of 500 or below, which is a score that would basically exclude you from any traditional bank loan. Um, we do loans on uh, for folks who really have no collateral to secure the loan, and we are lending uh, based on their character. And we have observed their character um, by them going through our basic business planning course, by um, using institutions within their community as the convener for the program. We don't you don't come to our program to go to the trainings. You go to a church or a school or a nonprofit uh, in your neighborhood. And many of these communities are very closely knit. And people 
can attest, oh, this family, they work very hard and, you know, they, they, they're they um, very ambitious. And, and, and so we will lend where a traditional lender won't lend. Now, we don't have very big loans. Our loans cap out at $25,000. Um, uh, but the idea here is to, to, to build from the ground up and hopefully help that business grow into larger, more traditional loans as time goes on. Okay, that's great. Now, my next question um, from the, or I think it's from our Twitter feed, um, is interested in transnational networks, noting that immigrants provide great opportunity in terms of the distribution of products manufactured in local systems. So the question is, does We Global Network um, work with transnational diasporas networks um, to help out local products uh, and their worldwide distribution? This is a question. Yes, this is a particular passion of mine. Um, I know that um, there are increasing number of strategies, uh, particularly uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and the Brookings Institution and their Global Cities Initiative, to help American economies, metropolitan economies, grow by um, tapping into foreign direct investment as well as international trade. Um, there is some, not a lot, but there's a little bit of academic research um, that really um, is able to quantify that growing immigrant and diaspora communities um, help foster more international trade in foreign investment. What doesn't exist are well-structured and certainly well-marketed, because I can't find them, uh, programs on the local level. Um, we are very much trying to do that here informally in, in uh, Southeast Michigan and in the Detroit metro area. But I think this is an incredible area for growth. I, I do want to credit um, the Moat Center for their Diaspora Nation report. It's something that really inspired me to think about this issue. But um, I would uh, love to connect and, uh, with, the, with the questioner and, and figure out if there are good models on how um, we can connect you know, the entire economy in a particular metro area with the diaspora networks uh, in order to, to build those bridges between those in uh, a diaspora network who could help with distribution models and those who, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the overall economy, who might not know how to build those distribution models. So I think there's wonderful opportunity here. I know it happens somewhat naturally, but I wonder if there are opportunities for us to grow um, those that mutual benefits in that way. That's great. So I'm going to go now to a couple of questions on international students. Um, the first comes from Art, who's with Inter Hartford in the US. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a technical question. I think we could go long. We don't have much time. So sort of a quick answer on on the whole question of how do international students stay uh, legally after their visas expire, and how workable is the EIR? Um, so how you're addressing that issue of legality and, and long-term retention. Sure. So that's from Art Feltman. And I hope he will attend our date and convening. We'd love to see him again. Um, we mostly market what is called the Optional Practical Training Visa, or OPT. And it is something that most international students in the United States have as part of their student visa. As long as they work in the field of study, um, they can work for 12 months. And by executive order under President uh, Bush, uh, uh, um, he extended that for STEM students to, for, to an additional 17 months if the employer uses what's called the E-Verify system. Um, so that's what we mostly market to our employers is use of the OPT. And it's an opportunity where the employer, without paying any additional fees, can hire an international student and then determine whether that student is viable for the employer to invest in other strategies like an H-1B visa. None of those strategies are perfect at this moment, and they all um, retain a risk. I mean, this year there were three times as many H-1B applications as there were spots. Oh, wow. um, and many others, like Cal Ganesan, make it through uh, relatives helping them with uh, app visa applications, or they get married, or they end up working long enough that they can file for their own uh, residency. Um, so there's no perfect solution, but there are pathways. Many people are able to get through the system. And um, it's a little bit of a funnel process. And we just try to make sure that employers are aware of all the opportunities that exist. Great. 
My next question is from Adela Schulber, and she asks, in addition to the action to retain immigrant students, what do you do to help immigrants with foreign diplomas and foreign experience integrate um, into the Detroit workforce? So I would highly recommend to look at IMPRINT, uh, which is the Immigrant Professional Integration Network. It is a national network in the United States of five partners that work on this exact issue. Um, in Detroit, while we work um, on policy and strategy with most of those organizations in the IMPRINT network, we work closely with Upwardly Global, which is one of those five organizations. It's a national organization with offices in New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Detroit, and I believe it in, uh, in the D.C. area now. And um, we have worked with them to write out licensing criteria and strategies for foreign trained and educated skilled workers under Michigan professional codes. And we've done that with the State Licensing Bureau. And then secondly, we have a full-time staff person that the state has funded to meet one-on-one -on -one with those skilled immigrants and refugees who are more than one and a half times as likely to be unemployed or underemployed than U.S. counterparts with those skills. So these are folks who come as engineers, maybe refugees from Syria who are engineers, but who end up driving a taxi cab because they're not sure how to connect to an engineering job. And we work with them both one-on-one -on -one as well as provide some online tools to help guide them through the process. Okay, that that's great. I have a, fi a final question. It's a difficult question from um, from our Twitter feed. But she, uh, uh, we have the question is, how do you respond to people who are concerned that ret retaining international graduates is creating a brain drain in their home countries? Um, that you're creaming a crop of their of their of their for their students. I don't I don't think there's a short answer to that question, but maybe Steve, if you can tell us what you tell people. Uh, when they ask you sure. that question? Well, I think um, well chronicled in that Moat Center report, Diaspora Nation, I mean, there is a constant churn between human talent, uh, goods in marketplaces uh, between our countries and those across the world. So we are, first of all, enhancing the brain talent by educating so many international students, most of whom continue to go back to their country. Um, even when our international student retention program, we have built into our uh, model explaining to employers that even if you love the student that you're employing through the OPT, you may not be successful in getting them an H-1B and they may have to go back to their home country, in which case you now have a friend in that country that could be a future trading partner. And so this is all part of a complex transnational process that it goes on between our economies and people. And um, uh, you know it's been going on for a long time. Uh, some people do stay in the United States, but not everyone is able to. And uh, hopefully with the opportunities uh, to increase trade as well as those who do return home, uh, we create uh, mutually beneficial opportunities between our countries. And, and uh, that's the answer I would provide. Well, that, that's brilliant. A perfect, a perfect, um, a perfect ending for today's Q and A. I, I'd like to thank both of you, Steve and Sarah, for a, a very interesting conversation about the, about the investments in people and in ideas that we need to transform our cities into engines of economic prosperity. I hope everyone in the audience has learned as much as I have today from these great ideas. Um, all of them ready to be replicated or adapted in a city near you. So do take note, uh, connect, and get started. We've now concluded the formal portion of today's webinar, um, and we are at the end of our Q&A. I would like to close by asking our uh, guest speaker, Steve, um, a quick question that I like to ask our, our speakers. What is the, just, if you had to choose one word, one idea, what is the one most important secret to your success? <laughs> One word. Well, yeah, it's a um, tough question. <laughs> I, I, I would just say the paradigm shift. So it's two words. What is that? The paradigm shift I spoke of. Paradigm, paradigm shift. shift. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay. And for both of you, starting with, with Steve, what's your next move? What's the next big idea on the horizon for you at Global Detroit? The next, uh, the next horizon, and we are tackling more 
neighborhood uh, level uh, in, in the city of Detroit um, opportunities as well as want to look at some of the gateway jobs for those who uh, emigrate to our community who don't have formal education and make sure that those opportunities are, are fully mined. We, we, we don't have some of the programs that a Welcoming Center for New Pennsylvanians in Philadelphia have. We're also very excited that the mayor of Detroit is about to appoint a director of Immigrant International Affairs at the beginning of June. And uh, as I mentioned, we are hiring a full-time corporate outreach people person. So we're very excited about those opportunities. Yeah, sounds like a busy season ahead. How about you, Sarah? What's the next uh, big move on your horizon? Uh, well, I'm working with my colleague, Tammy Huang, who's participating in the webinar today on creating a small business loan program through the city. Um, we don't know yet for sure that it's going to happen, but that's what we're working on. Kind of the well, type of program that Steve described. Yeah, seeding seeding new opportunity and uh, for Hamilton and mm -hmm. its immigrant community. That's great. <clears throat> well, okay. Thank you very much um, to both of you. Our time has run out. Um, on behalf of all of our participants and the Cities of Migration team here at the Global Diversity Exchange and our co-hosts at Welcoming America. I want to thank Steve Tubachman from Global Detroit and Sarah Whalen from Global Hamilton for a, a brilliant exchange of ideas. And as always, a very special thank you to Evelyn Sue, uh, who produces our webinar series here at the Learning Exchange. To our audiences in Toronto, Detroit, Hamilton, and in cities of migration everywhere, uh, I want you to imagine this excellent work being interpreted in your city, adapted by your organization, or changing your neighborhood. We'd like to hear your stories and share more good practice, so let's stay connected.